Greetings and welcome to PhotoApps.expert live training, episode 1600. No, it's not actually six, session 1600. It's like a we start a new prime primary digit, uh, whatever, the front numbers. We start a new one of those every time we start a new app, and that means this is the 16th app, or at least 16th series on an app that we have done on this site. That's a lot. It's, it, we're getting up there. At some point, you're going to have to get to five numbers, and then it's all going to go crazy. Um, today is about Pixelmator. Now, when you look at the numbers and you see like this one's 1600, 00, that means that this is the overview. This is a very, very large, big picture, step back view of the app. We're going to talk about what it does as a whole. We're going to look at uh, the features as a whole. Not, We're not going to get deep dive, deep dive into any particular feature, any particular nuance of it. This is more of a big picture, just take a look at what the whole thing is, so that you, as the audience, can gauge an interest of whether you want to continue with this series or not. Whether you think this is an app that interests you, or whether this is one that you'll just give a pass to, but I'm pretty willing to wager that most of you are going to like this one because Pixelmator's kind of a big deal. So Pixelmator has quite a history. It's been around for a long time. Um, I believe it's won a bunch of Apple awards. It's been one of these apps that's an image editing app on Mac OS and on iOS that has taken advantage of every last little capability that Mac OS or iOS have delivered. So when Apple comes out and says, hey, we've got a new version of our OS coming at the, when they do at their WWDC conferences, and there's always some major component. You know, this year we're introducing metal, and metal means you can take your graphics processing all the way down to the metal of the processor. And companies like these guys go, oh, that's cool. And they take advantage of it completely. They utilize it to its max potential and build these new features into their software, into their apps, and they take advantage of what Apple is doing. So when that regards, you're going to find that this is only available on Mac. If you are not a Mac user, if you are a Windows um, slash Android user, then I'm afraid Pixelmator isn't going isn't to do it for you. But on the Mac side, it's pretty wicked cool. So on the from the very highest level, it is an image editor, but it's more than just like a Photoshop. It's more like a Photoshop slash Illustrator combined, sort of. They're they're doing more with vector-based work in the future. They've got on their web page, they've got like a little kind of curtain revealing just a little peek. They're going to be doing a bit more with it. But as it is, it's got, I would say it's, it's probably more like a Photoshop as it is today with vector shapes inside of Photoshop and not that it's a true vector program. Um, totally non-destructive. Every image you drop in there, you can scale up and down all you want. Um, it's uh, it's pretty It's pretty impressive. I am definitely liking what I've seen so far. Now, the version we're looking at here is called Pixelmator Pro. It is their Pro version. It is the bigger version. I believe that the old Pixelmator has essentially ceased development. They kind of took a big step. Uh, it might have even been a full rewrite to do the Pro version, really take advantage of some of the new tech. You know, at some point, you just kind of go, got to gotta brush the old stuff under the rug and start over again. And um, I believe that that is what has happened here with Pixelmator Pro. Now, there is still Pixelmator on iOS. It is not... Pixelmator on iOS is basically like Pixelmator, the old Pixelmator, the original Pixelmator, the non-pro Pixelmator, was on macOS. I have no idea if they're doing a Pixelmator Pro on iOS. I would imagine they are because there are a lot of the same technologies available between the two hardware platforms. But for now, we've got Pixelmator Pro on macOS and not on iOS. So Pixelmator Pro on macOS is what we're going to be focusing on throughout this entire tour. Excellent. All right, folks, this is a live show for those who are watching live. You can participate in the chat. I see there's a few people here right now. If you have a question for me, just pop it in there. I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I am not yet an expert at this app. This is part of how we do it on this show, if you've never seen this before. I am relatively new to Pixelmator Pro. I have used it over the years. I've owned it for, well, forever, and I've kind of played with it here and there a little bit. I've never gotten super, super deep into it, and that is part of what we do here. Before every session, when I, I decide that, you know, this week we're talking about brushes or whatever it is, um, if I, I will then take the time before that to really deep dive in and understand as much as I possibly can so that I can relay that to you. So we are learning together, which means if you see something or you know something that I have missed, by all means, tell me. It's fun to be able to share, share those experiences with the audience as we go. Um, but overall, what we end up doing is learning together and, uh, and probably discovering some pretty cool things about the software. So again, to those in the chat room, hello and welcome. I see Whiskey Throttle says, you have no idea what a Pixelmator is. Well, hopefully by the end of the session, you will. So with that said, let me get this system ready for you. Let's get the right page up. I have it in here somewhere. And we will get ready to go. Where, where did it, I guess I just must have quit the app. 
So here, even here, look at this. You can see if I um, switch over here, you can see there's I have the old Pixelmator. This is the old icon, and Pixelmator Pro is what we're doing today. So we're working with Pixelmator Pro. I've got Lightroom open in the background just because I wanted to pull some photos out of Lightroom. Pixelmator Pro is not an asset management tool. This is not a DAM, a digital asset management tool. So you still need something to manage your photos. You can, from Lightroom or from photos, or you know, pretty much like you've you can with any other tool, you can send the image that you're working on off to that picture for editing and then bring it back into your asset management tool. So in this case here, I'd be, I'm usually working mostly in Lightroom. I would send the photo off to Lightroom to be worked on. Now, right away, before, you know, let's just talk about that before I even get into, let's go to the right screen here, before I even get into the app itself. Um, <laughs> whiskey's pouring a drink and it's gonna learn, excellent. Um, I gotta do that one of these days, just like, oh, no. Um, if you're using a tool like Lightroom or like Photos even, which has significant image editing tools in it, right? Photos has got a, a fair number. We just finished a, soda, a Photos series. There's quite a lot in there. Um, if you're in Lightroom, there's a, quite a lot more in there. Even if you're on Lightroom CC, the new Lightroom CC, there's still a lot of features in there, a lot of capabilities. Then there's Lightroom Classic, even bigger. At some point, you go, well, why do I need an external editor? Like, why would I even bother with that, right? All the photo editing tools that I need are built into the photo editing management app that I use. Totally fair. Uh, I barely, barely, barely ever leave Lightroom to do image editing as far as color correction, enhancement, um, obviously things like cropping, straightening, that sort of thing, perspective distortion, uh, retouching, all that stuff. I pretty much do everything in Lightroom. It really is when I want to go beyond that, when I want to do composites, blending multiple images together, or add titling, or build a thumbnail for a show like this. Those sort of things you can't do in your base digital asset management slash image editor tool. For those, you need to move on to something else. So for many people, that's going to be Photoshop. And if you are a Lightroom user, then pretty much by default these days, you also have Photoshop, and so you might not really think you have a need for this. But you might still want to use it because it's easier. Uh, it, it might be more intuitive to you. It might be faster. There's any number, you might just like it better. There's any number of reasons to use an alternative tool. And then of course, if you're using something smaller like Photos, well, Photos doesn't really have anywhere near the capability. So uh, it's really easy to see why you'd want to move on beyond from Photos, take it out to somewhere else. All of that said, whew, already getting thirstier. All of that said, um, the uh, Pixelmator Pro is, or can, I should say, um, edit from a raw file. So you can send a raw file to it. So you could actually do even all your base image editing in Pixelmator Pro. That would require, however, somehow sending that raw file off to it, saving that in a format that your digital asset management tool can read, and then bringing it back in. I would venture to say that most people, most serious photographers who are looking for a tool like Pixelmator are not going to be sending off the raw image. The raw editing tools in Adobe's, um, well, the entire the Adobe suite are fantastic. Uh, even the ones that are built into photos are pretty darn good. So you may not really need to go to a raw tool. That said, that is where we're going to start. We're going to start with a raw image, opening up and doing some basic image manipulation to it just to show the tools that are there. And then from there, we're gonna move on to all the other uh, tools that are inside of the app. If you don't want to use the basic image editing tools, let's say you are using Lightroom, but you do want to use it for your text or graphic overlays or blending or image composition, that sort of thing, by all means you can. You can take your images from Lightroom, open, do your initial processing in Lightroom, do your color correction, whatever you're gonna do, and then send the photo or photos off to Pixelmator Pro, do your compositing, blending, et cetera there, and then have a final image that you would bring back if you wanted to bring back into Lightroom or just leave it somewhere else. So lots of different options here. I just want to kind of cover that little basis. If you're starting in Lightroom, you're going, well, hold on a second. Why would I even? That hopefully helps explain why. So with that said, let's, uh, let's just jump into it. All right, so that's why that's open. Let me hide this. I actually have a raw image on the desktop. Um, I think I have, didn't I? It's, oh, shoot. I didn't save it on the desktop. It is. This is the photo, where's the photo go that I was gonna use? Let's use, no, I was gonna use one of these. Here we go. Take one of these pictures. I'm going to reveal this in the finder. I'm, this does not have, incidentally, it does not have an, a way to send the raw file directly from Lightroom off the other app, at least that I haven't seen. Um, some apps build a plugin so that you would go, let me just show you how that works on some other apps. You would go to the file menu and you would say, a uh, plug-in extras, and you'll see here like Aurora HDR, DxO Optics Pro, Photomatics Pro, Luminar. 
these all have methods to send the original raw file off to it. I haven't found a way to do that yet with Pixelmator Pro. If someone knows how, please do let me know. But as far as I know, there isn't a way to do that. So I'm going to just find the image in, in Lightroom and say reveal in Finder, and off it'll go. I see Construction Podcast has a very, very valid question. I should have brought this up in the beginning. Uh, he's asking, or she's asking, how much the app, how, what does the app cost? How much is it? I want to say 50, but we're going to double check that right now. Here we are in the App Store. Pixelmator Pro is the one. Now, I've already got it installed, which can make it a little bit tricky to find the price. Um, here we go, $59.99. So it's $60. That's, of course, a one-time cost. Now, if you were a Pixelmator user before, then as far as I know, this was not an upgrade path. It was a whole new version. But you know what? These kind of prices, it's kind of hard to argue. Compared to, if you just if you want to do the comparison to Photoshop slash Lightroom, um, you're paying 10 bucks a month. So that's six months worth of the Photoshop Lightroom combo, um, one way to look at it. And, uh, and this, of course, will last you until they decide to do another complete major revision that they want to charge for again, by which point I think you'll say it's fair <laughs> to charge again. Um, you know, 60 bucks is nothing for an app like this. Okay, so with that said, let's go back here. Let's go back into Photoshop, or rather Lightroom, find the app, uh, find my image, and I just, it's Command-Shift-R. I never remember what the where the commands are. Nope, command shift R apparently, maybe it's command R. There we go, command R, reveal. There's the picture that I want. There's one we're gonna use. We're just going to drag and drop that onto Pixelmator Pro. Opening document, and away we go. All right, let's hide everything else. Let me actually just kind of hide the entire UI. So this is how it starts. A single window, your, your view, your scene opens up here in a single window. All of your tools live within this window. And as you can see, everything resizes in here. My tools being on the left, the layers. If I want to open up my layers as either thumbnails or as a list view, those show up here on the left. And on the right-hand side, this one little icon up here, zoom in nice and close, that one little icon there opens up to my tools. I can, again, resize the window however I like, or in this case, I'm going to go ahead and go full screen because it's pretty that way. Let's get rid of all the other crud on there. The layers list, you saw you can view it in either thumbnails or list. Right now, we're just going to leave it at list. Maybe once we get some more on here, we'll switch back to thumbnails if I remember to. Um, but then you have other commands in here like show rules if you want to get your rulers up there. Pretty common kind of thing you would expect to find. Show grid if you want to have a grid overlay. Um, and that, of course, can be adjusted. And then show guides if you want to have your guides up. And I think we don't have anything on here to really do guides with. So we'll, well I'm going to leave it turned on, and we'll see when they pop up later on perhaps. And they have a little show info bar that can come up, and it gives you all kinds of good info across the top here, which is, I'm realizing, probably kind of hard to see. Let me zoom into that. So cursor position, width and height of your document, position change. So if you're moving things around, you'll see how they change. Start position, angle as you're angling things. Your display profile, how many bits you're working in, and your current resolution of the file, which is all great info. But for now, let's just hide that because, oops, wrong view. Let's just hide that because I don't really need to look at all that. We're looking at the raw file. We see here it says raw layer. It does show that it is a raw file. So there's a ton of tools on here that we're going to skip right past for now. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom to where it says adjust colors. So each of these tools in here is it's deceivingly simple, I would say. When you look at it, you think, okay, well, it's, it's got a few tools. It's got like a sharpen and a lighten and a draw tool and a text tool. And Okay, I've seen all that before. Each one of these has sometimes multiple layers deep. I think that until you really spend some time in this app, it can be easy to discard as being, or dismiss as being quite simple. There's a lot in here, and there's a lot hidden under the hood, which is going to make this whole training session a lot of fun because we're going to we have a lot of stuff to dive into. Um, but just I'm just saying that just like you think, you know, if you look at it, if you download it or you get a trial, I'm pretty sure they have a trial, and you look at it and go, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's got a few things. It's way more than that. Um, if you really want to just jump ahead of this whole course, just go to their website. They have a massive amount of data on the website with probably quite literally hundreds of pages about it because almost every category has a learn more. And within that, there might be a dozen more learn more. So there is a ton of info on their website. So I would encourage you to check that out if you you know can't wait for all of this. You just want to jump into it. Probably going there would be a really good idea. Anyway, so with all that said, let me scroll back down to the bottom here. Um, near the very bottom, you can see the little tooltip pops out. We're grabbing this one here called Adjust Colors. Click on that. And at first, you go, okay, it's got white balance and lightness. Now, this is the first kind of nod to the hat, tip of the hat, nod, whatever, of just how much deeper this goes than you think it is. So, let's see what I mean here. 
So I opened up the color adjust, right, color adjustments, and we've got a histogram at the top. Okay, that's great, and we can see the image is probably looking a little bit dark via the histogram. We can pretty clearly see that here. I've got a white balance. Well, here's all my info about the, the shot, right? This is a raw shot. It shot on a GH5. It was shot with a Leica 8 to 18 lens. Okay, cool. ISO 418 mil left 10 hundredth of a second. Okay, cool. Uh, white balance. I got white balance in here. You know, I can I can do a little warming and cooling. Yeah, yeah, pretty much standard. You know, you'd expect to find that anywhere. Okay, well, it's actually, it was kind of okay the way it was. Let me just, like, reset that. Maybe look a little bit warmer. Yeah, why not? Um, lightness. All right, it's clearly dark. Let's let's bring up the exposure on this a little bit. And remember, we are working with a raw file since I brought the raw file in, so that's good. I'm not going to uh, totally clip this or anything or just be mushing up my shadows. Uh, maybe take my black point down or up, rather. Lower the black point by raising the slider. I never did quite understand that. But anyway, um, so we darken that a little bit. Okay, well, that's that's it. And there's there's some presets here, but, you know, blah. I don't want to presets. So white balance and lightness. You're like, hey, that, that's that's it? Really? No. That's not it. See up here at the top. It's very, it's hidden. Honestly, I think that it could be a little easier to find. Color adjustments. Add. Little blue button. We click on add. And, oh, here's a whole bunch more stuff. Let me zoom out a little bit. Whole bunch more. You've got hue and saturation, color balance, colors, replace color, levels, curves, channel mixer, white balance. Oh, no, sorry. Black and white. Whew. Color monochrome, sapia, fade, invert, sharpen, grain, and the ability to save presets, save defaults, so we'll save presets, and even save a default. So if you have, if you come up with some recipe, you, just, you always want your pictures to get that when they're opened, boom, default. That's cool. All right, so let's, I, we're going to save going into all of these for when we get a deep dive into this session, but let me just grab a couple. Let me just do like, a, uh, well, the hue and saturation. This picture needs a little bit of saturation, so let's pull that up. So we've got a little saturation there. Nice. A little pump up the saturation there. Obviously, you've got your vibrance as well and your hue rotation. Uh, we can do things like go into curves. We've got full curves tool in here. So like if I wanted to put a little S-curve on that thing, really crunch up the, the contrast on that, I could do that a little bit. Um, we can go between RGB and luminance curves, individual RGB channels. You got automatic adjustments on there. Nice, good, good. Uh, we got things like uh, color monochrome, sepias, fades, invert the image, sharpen, add grain. Let's do grain. I always like grain. So let's see, I added grain. Let me get some, my shadows got a little too crunchy. Let's pull that up just a little bit. And I'm going to hit Command-1 to zoom into 100%. So a lot of the keyboard shortcuts that you're used to from Photoshop, if you're used to keyboard shortcuts from Photoshop, will apply here, which is nice. A lot of the apps these days are using, I want to call them universal keyboard shortcuts, but using very common ones, making it easier to transition from one app to another. Um, Construction Podcast is a bit off topic, but could you do a video on what apps are on your Mac? I you get excited seeing my dock. My Mac is a disaster. I have so many apps on here, but eh, maybe I'll do that one day. Uh, all right, so let's see here. So we're doing grain. So there's grain, and you can see I've got grain size and grain intensity. So that's nice. Nice little grain tool in here. And um, turn that down a little bit. It's actually pretty good. I'm, I can be quite critical of grain tools. I think that often they don't look anything like grain. Um, but this is pretty pretty good. That's a pretty heavy grain in there. Take my size up a little bit. That's not too bad. Actually, I think it's a, it's a reasonably nice grain tool. Reasonably nice. We're gonna, we're gonna. That's gonna be my official diagnosis. Is reasonably nice. Command zero to zoom back out. That's great. Uh, anything else in here? Anyway, a lot of other tools in here. So clearly, we have a lot to explore in this space. So there's your basic photo editing tool. So that's the kind of stuff that if you're using Lightroom or Photos or if you're still using Aperture, those are the tools that you would find in there. And then you get your crop and rotate. Obviously, it does that too. So okay, there's our basic stuff. But now let's take it beyond that space. Let's take it beyond the basic image editing. Because this is the kind of stuff that, again, you might have already done. You might have done that in Lightroom or Photos or Capture One or wherever you were, and now you want to move on to something else. And so that's what we're going to fly through next. Because, again, there is just so, so much of it. So let's go up to the top. We'll just start at the top here. Um, styles. The first one up here is styles, which if you open to photo is a little odd because they don't actually do anything. Like, well, we can't do a style thing. Okay, well, we can't add a style to a photo because a style is meant for an object. So let's go up here to the plus, up in the top left, and you see up here we got a little plusy on here. Click on that, and we can choose to add a different type of layer. I can add a blank layer, or I can add a text layer, a shape layer with a basic shape to start with. Um, color adjustments. This is the kind of stuff we're getting into in future sessions, but you can add overall color adjustments and effects. Look at all these effects. I have to keep zooming out because the menus are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Wow, that's actually really something that was looking at. Ridiculous. Um, you can add a image straight from photos. You can bring something in from your FaceTime camera or just choose another file on your computer that you want to place on here. 
Let me just start with, let's just do a, let's do text. Why not? We'll start with text. I'll take text, put that in there. I'm going to type in Slovenia because that's where we were here. And um, there's my basic text. Okay, so now I've got this style thing. So let's come back to style. Let's just play with text since I just opened text. Down here at the bottom-ish right, you can see there's my little type dealio. It's actually highlighted for me now. I click on that. And here are all of my text tools. You know, it's not a whole lot, you know, some basic text tools. But we also have over here presets. Um, I can save these out as well. So that's really cool, right? Let's say that you do, let's say that you do um, uh, uh, thumbnails for your YouTube videos all the time. <laughs> you could have presets of a font, a size, a basic text, like whatever. You could have presets in here, which as I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, yeah. That's what I, because this is what I use Photoshop for every day is to build YouTube thumbnails, whether they're for, well, video thumbnails for my YouTube videos, for these training videos. And I think that what I'll have to do is start using this tool to build them because that's a really good way for me to use it every day to know that I can jump into it every day. So this right here, right away, I'm looking at that going, oh, that's really cool. That gives me a, um, an easy a one-click way to ensure that I have some consistency. Now, I don't generally have consistency across all my titles. I do tend to mix them up a little bit, but it's a starting point. So that, I like that. I, I think that's pretty cool in there. All right, so we've got these in here. So I can, you know, click on the little subtitle. That was kind of small. Head was kind of small. Yeah, they're all pretty small. Um, but you can see what's, what's happening. Let me just undo a few times. Get back to that. So, okay, so we, what do we got here? Font. So, of, you know, access your full font library. That one looks kind of cool. Um, you know, great ones. Regular sizes on here. You can scroll. So I'm scrolling, two fingers scrolling over the size on the um, the size slider, size drop down, whatever you want to call that, guys. So I can just choose the number from there, or just hover my mouse over it and scale. Um, obviously, color stuff like that. I can grab. I can grab a color from the color picker, or I can grab an eyedropper here, and let's just grab like a red off the roof there. Cool. Uh, you know, alignment, those basic things. If you have multiple lines on here, character spacing, line height, and so on. Okay, so there's some basic type stuff. But what if we want to make it look cool? Well, this is where we can go back to the styles and things start to get a bit more interesting. So nothing's on right now. I can do things like enable stroke. I can put a stroke on this. Let's see, let's make that nice and big. Um, choose a different color. It's a color stroke. We're going to make that, um, I don't know what we're going to do. Let's make it like a obnoxious purple color. That is really hideous, but you can see it. Uh, so we can do a stroke on there. We can do a fill. It's already got a fill, but we can add a different fill onto that. We can put an inner shadow and this should put a big shadow on the inside of this thing. That, okay, so you can see it's kind of getting that inset deal looking. But then all of these are presets, right? Just click on one of these and it loads up a different preset for that object. So that's nice. We got the little preset styles in here that we can add. And those presets apply not just to text, but also to shape. So if I go in here and I say, let's just create a quick rectangle in here. Um, oh, it looks like it absorbed what I was playing with earlier. Oops, didn't mean to do a second one here. Let's just make that a little bigger. There we go. So I got a rectangle in here. Let's go back into these preset styles, and you can see they've got all these styles in here that I can add on. But then once they're added, uh, look at all these, you know, all the controls that you have. You've got your stroke and your fill and your inner shadow and so on that are all added in here. But then if I go up here to the top under style, let's go back to something a bit more interesting. There we go. There's, uh, you can add more. You've got multiple fills, multiple strokes, and so on onto these. So you can really start to kind of stack these up and make something quite customized and cool. So there's your basic, your what do they even call this, uh, style? Yeah, your basic style tools. You can see how these things are, are grouped together. You've got your style and then your arrangement and selection tools. And then underneath that, we come back up here. Yeah, no, come back up. I'm waiting for the, the pop-up to come up. There it is. Paint, color, fill, and erase. So pixel-based editing work. Um, repairing and cloning, and then enhancement, so sharpening, light and saturate, those are brushes, warping tools in there, and then drawing and shape drawing and type tools, which are about what we're kind of playing in right now. Um, and it adjusts colors and effects at the very, very end. We'll, we'll take a quick look at that at the end here. So you've got all of the basic tools in here to do this type of layout type work, right? So we've got our shapes in there. Um, if we want to get into pixel editing, you can go into the selection tools. And I like this. This is kind of a neat thing. You'll see this rectangular selection command comes up. So let's just say I draw a rectangular selection on here, right? There's my marching ants. Um, I want to add to that selection. Instead of having to remember which keyboard modifiers you hold down to add or subtract or intersect from the selection, there's little buttons here. Makes it easy. So I go, I want to add to this selection. So I just click and drag over there, and I've just added to that. Or I want to subtract. So I'm going to cut out a a line in the middle here. I want to do an intersect. I want the intersection of those right there. Let go and there's that uh, there's that selection made. So that's kind of nice. Nice little way to, 
to do that. But then you get into things like your magnetic lassos. Actually, here, let's go back into this real quick. You've got elliptical, kind of what you'd find in Photoshop, right? Rectangular, elliptical, row and column selection, great. And then you've got your, your more manual selection tools. So you have your magnetic selection, free selection, polygonal selection, magnetic selection. So if you're going to, let's just, let's just get rid of these things right now. If I wanted to go down here and start selecting, I don't know, let's uh, zoom into this little bit here. I wanted to select the ocean in the background there. I could take the select tool in here, the magnetic tool, and just kind of drag along. And, um, and with any luck in there, we're going to get a pretty accurate selection. Oops, I kind of messed up there. Uh, let's, let me let go. There we go. As you let go, it kind of goes, okay, what you've done so far is what you want to keep. So I can go ahead and click. You can kind of hear it clicking, I think. If I'm quiet. So it's, it's, it's magnetic, but it's also honoring the clicks in there. So I can do that. I'm not going to finish it. But there's a, there's a basic selection tool in there. Let me just escape out of that. Um, and then, of course, free selection, a polygonal selection, if you want to do your, your standard, you know, I want to select some funky shape kind of a thing. That's all, that all exists in there as well. And then you've got this painting selection. This is really neat. So let me go to new and same thing's going to change. No, I think that's it. I'm not yet clicking. I'm just running the mouse over this. And you can see how it is highlighting the area that is going to select when I click, which is kind of cool, right? So if I wanted to select that water, before I do anything, I can preview this and go, yeah, this is going to do a pretty good job here. So I can click on that and I can just, now I'm, now I'm clicking. And so it's leaving the yellow behind. So that, that's pretty good. We can see here, let me zoom in closer. We can see here that it got a little over aggressive on the front of this here. So I'm going to go in and say subtract and probably get a, well, actually that'll work just fine. Subtract there. Okay, good. Let's go back to add, um, add that in there. Yep. Good. Pretty cool, right? I really like this. I like the way that this, this guide comes up, little yellow overlay, really helps you to see exactly what's about to be selected. Um, it's pretty slick. It's pretty slick. Construction Podcast is saying, would you say it's a Photoshop replacement? I can't say that yet. Look, I don't think anything is a Photoshop replacement. If you're trying to look at Photoshop from the absolute start to finish of what it can do. I don't think anything is as big or as deep as Photoshop. Photoshop's kind of huge. But the thing about Photoshop is if this is Photoshop, most people probably use this much of it. So if what you need in this space right here, where it's this space, or it's this space, or it's this space, if that falls into what this does, then for you it is a Photoshop replacement. I am going to use it instead of Photoshop moving forward while the, for the duration that I'm doing this until I hit a wall and I have to go back to Photoshop. But that may never happen. I don't know if it will. By the time we're done with this whole thing, ask me that question again, and I'll be able to tell you whether it is, it is a valid Photoshop replacement for me. But again, it's very, very personal. It's very specific. Is it valid? Is it a Photoshop replacement for you? Only you could ultimately answer that, because of course, I don't know exactly what you're using Photoshop for. But I think for the vast majority of users who are using a very narrow band of what Photoshop is actually capable of, then uh, for those people, uh, probably will be because it really is doing a lot. So, so there we go. Um, Jason's asking, can you add Lightroom presets? No. no. So any presets like you'd find in an app like Lightroom are very much unique to that app. They are not saying, oh, add, um, I don't know, let's say add exposure, three stops of exposure and, and lift the shadows and drop the highlights. The preset isn't saying that in a generic sense. The presets are saying raise the Adobe Lightroom exposure up this much and the Adobe Lightroom black point here and take using the Adobe Lightroom tool, take this color and change it to that color. The presets that you install in an app like Lightroom are unique to Lightroom. You can't just take those presets and drop them into any other app. It's just, it never works that way because every program has its own proprietary way of doing things. Um, so that's, I mean, I may be speaking in large general terms there. There may be apps that have overlapping preset preview kind of things, but that's not, no, you're not going to find that here. That said, you can create your own presets in here. You can easily save your own presets, which means that I haven't looked yet, but it undoubtedly means that you can also buy and download um, and possibly buy presets from third parties to install. So that's that's something to uh, to consider for sure. Okay, let's get back into this here. Uh, so there's the selection tool. Really, that right there is, I'm really, really impressed by that. You can also do a color selection. So let me deselect what we've got in here. Let me zoom out a little bit. Um, let's just go back to the full view here. So I've, I've chosen the color selection. Let's, we'll go to new and I'm going to click and drag. You can see a little tolerance thing happening there. As I'm dragging it out, you can see when it's starting to select. 
So it's kind of, I clicked on something in the red roof, and so it's selecting that out. This is quite a narrow band of, of selection in here. Um, that's interesting, actually. Let me zoom in. Let's go in tighter. Let's try something like, there's this weird blue painted spot on the wall here. So it's kind of similar to the color selector. I mean, this is the color selector. Sorry, it's kind of similar to the, what was the other one called? The um, quick selection tool. Uh, I'm going to have to explore the differences herein, but uh, but right off, you can see what it's doing right there. It is just it is selecting based off of color pixels. Interesting. And I love this add, right? So I do that and then switch it into add mode. And I think by default it starts in add because you're adding you know, something to nothing, so you can get away with add to begin with. So you go, there's add, and let's get this blue down here, and add, and so on. So we're starting to to make those selections quite quickly. It's uh, it's pretty good. That is pretty good. Jason's got another great question here. Is Affinity Photo a similar app? Yes. They are both really good apps. From the looks of it, I'm still debating if I should buy a photo editing app. So Affinity Photo, I already did a complete series on. Um, that you can download today. That is available. That's something I did, um, I don't remember when I finished it, sometime last year. Um, I love Affinity Photo. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think if you want to ask me which one I think is better, um, I, it's good. well, first of all, the easy answer is going to be which one's better for you, just like with the Photoshop thing. But at this point, I don't know this one well enough to say whether this can do everything that Affinity Photo can do, whether it's faster or better or cleaner or anything else. Um, Affinity Photo is incredibly powerful. I absolutely love it. And, um, and I still use it for a lot of things. In fact, I still use it for a lot of the things that I'm going to start using this for just because I want to force myself to use this app more. But, uh, but so far, so far, I'm see what I'm seeing in here, nothing that I'm seeing in here is going to tell me, is saying to me I can't use this for the kind of stuff that I use Photoshop or Affinity Photo for. So uh, it's just, it's another alternative app from another company. And uh, so far, so good. So far, it's pretty awesome. Okay, so back to the, there's your selection tool. Uh, oops, let me see how much stuff there is. We've barely even started on here. Brushes, let's, let's just kind of speed things up a little bit here. I'm going to add another blank layer on this. And in fact, let's hide the layer underneath. Let's just hide the, um, the picture layer. And let's choose a better color, something nice and bright and saturated so it's easy to see on the screen. And you have brushes. Uh, check it out. Check out all these different brush presets that you have to choose from along with broken down into categories like your basic brushes or pens, crayons, pencils, and so on. Let's go for crayons, pick something nice and big, and start drawing with that. Um, in fact, here, let me do this. Let me add another layer underneath this, and I'm just going to fill that with white. Um, ooh, there's a good question. I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to select that. Let's find the fill command. Um, effects, fill, color fill. Probably color fill is all I need. Color fill. Click. Oh. Ah, there we go. It did red because that was selected. Let's go white. That would make sense. Let's go for a basic white. There we go. There's pure white. Let's, I don't want that in there. I'm going to, I'm going to select all. Can I select all and delete? Oh, I'm in the wrong layer. Select all and hit delete. There we go. And just fill with white. There it is. I, I feel like there's probably a different way to do that, but I've, I have done what I needed to do. All right, let's go back to this layer um, so I can paint on here so that you can see what's happening. So let's go back to the brush, back to the brush, and I'm just going to grab a few random, oh, now I'm painting in white, genius, uh, a few random brush strokes in here just so you can see the kind of stuff that's in there. This has, by the way, full tablet support. So if you, oh, I guess I need to actually select the brush. Good job. If you are using a Wacom tablet, you will be able to use that in here. I was going to hook up my Wacom tablet, but I couldn't find my pen. So I will have to do that in another session. But you do have um, quite a few brushes in here to choose from. And for each one of these brushes, let's just grab, we'll grab one more to show scattered brush in there. For each one of these, you'll notice to the right of it is a little edit button. Let's zoom in on that. So right next to that is an edit button. If you click on that, then you get into the real meat of what this can do. And this isn't just what you're seeing in front of you. There's your general command. There's your shapes. So if you want to change the, sh the basic shape, shape direction of your brush, the grain amount of the brush, the stroke, the dynamics, and you get a preview up here of what it's going to look like, even down to pressure. So if you're using a pressure-sensitive tablet, um, how much difference is pressure going to make to the size, to the opacity? If it's a brush that supports tilt, is tilt going to have an effect on it, and so on. So all of these things are, are, um, are in here for you to totally customize your brush and make it whatever you want it to be. Jason's got another question. What pen do you recommend? Wacom. That's it. Wacom makes the best pens out there. There are cheaper ones. 
Um, there's a lot of companies that make them, but Wacom's been around for so long. Their products are rock solid. I own two, yeah, I guess two. Yeah, two tablets of theirs. One of them I've had since 2000 and no, before that, 1999. I'm pretty sure 99 is maybe 2000 at the latest is when I got that tablet. Still works, still supported. I have a much newer one that I got, I want to say it's been probably eight years ago that I got it now. Um, still works great, fully supported. It has more features. It is a fine, higher resolution than the older tablet. Um, but I have their hardware lasts forever. It works really well. It's rock solid. They keep on supporting it. They're just top-notch products. Um, you will spend more to buy Wacom than you will to buy some other third-party, um, other random one. I'm not sponsored by Wacom. I've actually I have done work for them in the past, but that was like a decade ago, so it doesn't count. Uh, yeah, just buy Wacom. Spend the extra money, buy Wacom. You will not regret it. Fantastic tablets. Okay, that, and this, that's my opinion, obviously. I'm sure if you Googled it, you'd find all kinds of other opinions as well, but that's my opinion. All right, let's bring it back into this. So lots of different brushes in here. Lots of fun stuff to explore with in there. Um, the fill tool, we looked at kind of by accident. There's an eraser tool, and the cool thing about the eraser tool is you actually have um, access to all the brushes. Let's see how you get to them. Uh, somewhere in here. I read this somewhere. I don't know how to get to it. But you have access to all of your brushes as erasers. You can turn, you can make any brush an eraser. Healing. So you got repair. Let's go back to our photos since we're now doing this. Let me delete that layer and delete that layer and let's put our photo layer back on. So you have a heal tool. Let me zoom out of this a little bit. Uh, let's say, here, this is a good example. Let's say I want to get rid of these windows up there. I go to my heal tool and I can't do anything. It says raw. Convert raw layers to regular image layers to edit. All additional raw data will be discarded. So here's one of those situations where you do need to get into pixel-based editing, so I can't do it to the raw file. Well, neither can Photoshop, so don't get too excited. What you can do is you can, uh, you can convert it to a, a pixel file, but you can duplicate the layer first. So if you're really concerned that you might want to come back, but at this point, it's probably time to step away. Like you've, you've done your basic image editing, you've done everything you're going to do to the raw file. Before you go to the next level, it's time to convert it away from raw. And in here, the way to do that, there's a simple one little button. Just click Convert. I click on the Convert button, and it becomes pixels. Let me undo that, because if I really didn't want to do that, if I really want to save that raw data, I can just select that layer and duplicate it. Where's Command-Shift-D? Uh, there's a command in there. One of these is duplicate. That must have been it, because it's thinking. There it is. And now I've got that raw layer copy. And so now I can take that one. Let's convert that one. And now I've got the original one intact. So I can just hide that. And it's just I can even lock it. And it's just there for safety. Um, anyway, let's go back into this. I want to get rid of these buildings. Uh, I'm sorry, these windows on the building or skylights. Uh, you can see I can change my brush size in here. If I right click or, or control click on the screen, you get a little brush size dealy here. What I haven't found yet is if there's a really good keyboard combo command to change your brush size. If there is, I'll find it because that's something that um, that I absolutely adore in Lightroom and Photoshop. It's like Control Shift. I think is I think I try to just do it it's so intuitively now. And you you click and drag and you can drag up down to change the size, left right to change the softness. It's brilliant. I'm hoping that's in here and I just haven't found it yet. If someone knows, please tell me. Anyway, uh, so let's go for a slightly smaller brush size. And then I'm going to go in here, I'm just going to paint over that and that and that and let it disappear and eat those up. Um, just get rid of that skylight there and they're gone. Now that that one, this one over here was really good, the first one. This one's not quite as good. Oh, that's, it's good, it's not as good. This is something where Photoshop is just amazing at. Um, let's, do, let's be a little bit more judicious about it. Let's take care of that window. Let's do one at a time on here instead of trying to get fancy and doing a bunch at once. And, you know, that is that is doing a very good job. I think, you know, looking at it yourself, you know what it used to look like. You go, well, there was a window there. I can see a little shadowing. So, but a little, quick little extra retouching. It's, it's going pretty good. I would say that is a pretty good job. It is hard to beat Photoshop's um, healing tool because it is insanely good. Uh, I know together with the algorithm. Um, it is insanely good. This is very good. It's not insanely good. But I think with a little extra work, a little extra retouching, I think it works out just fine. So, yeah. 
you know what you got. Um, there is also, there is a cloning tool. Is that next on the list? I think it is. Yeah, there's a cloning tool. So if you want to do basic cloning, you can do that as well. And that's cool. You know, you go, okay, I want to clone from here to there. See, I love the way the preview shows up, right? I've said, this is the window that I want to clone, and we're going to put that window right there, and I just click, and I've got a window, or I, or I go and I click, and I paint that in, and I paint it in that window. And there's tool. You can see I've got my softness up way too high on that. Let's bring the softness down. Let me undo, undo, undo. Okay, let's take my softness down. And brush size is a bit too big. Let's make that a little bit smaller. And let's just paint a window in here like so. Okay, that's pretty awful. But you get the idea. I'd probably put that on a separate layer and then fix it. Anyway, so you got your cloning tool. You have under here, let's see what's next. We're not even going to look at all these. There's just too much in here. There's a sharpening tool, sharpening brush. So you can sharpen. Lighten, so basically dodging and burning. Um, where's darken? Lighten, well, I guess it's under here, right? Lighten, click and hold on that. Nope, click and hold, there we go. Lighten and darken, so basically dodge and burn. Um, this is sharpen, soften, and smudge, so you can soften your image if you want to. If it's a little bit too sharp, you can do that. Um, saturate, and again, this is a brush. It's a saturation brush if you want to brush that in. And then the warp. Warp's kind of cool. Let me just, just for fun, we'll just do this. If I wanted to, like, I don't know, warp this building for some reason, you could do that. That's one of those things that makes a really cool demo, but I've never found a practical use for the warp tool. Other than like, make a little bit of a smile. You know, like if someone's not smiling, you're like you just want to give them a little, eh, eh, I've used it for that. That can work, that can work. A pen tool for doing shapes, your custom shapes. We kind of sort of explored that earlier, but, um, but there's a pen tool for drawing shapes. You can freeform or draw using a variety of, um, yeah, you're basically, it's like you know, hold down the shift key to do fixed points and so on. Um, or click and draw, tr click and drag, do beze hands and so on, be uh, beze tools, beze handles. Handles, that's what I was looking for, beze handles. Um, we've got our basic free form. You can just draw, and you can see that even though I am just drawing, it is now a, an actual shape. And then the shape tool itself, we briefly saw earlier, rectangle, random rectangle, stars, lines, custom shapes, and so on. So lots of stuff in there. Text we looked at very briefly, and then at the bottom there is the add effects. So let me just get rid of all this stuff let's bring my raw layer back on and i'm gonna to have to convert that again so let's unlock it and oh, actually i don't have to convert the raw layer excellent um i can there's all these fun little presets like you know mandala I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff in here that you can do um do with these so it's just to just to get an idea of the the wild and crazy stuff that you have within this um twirl you can change your twirling of that there's you know it's fun there's madness to be found in here for sure Lots and lots of different tools, wave tools, and there's these are all manipulated to bubble, bubble, which I'm totally not managing. Oh, there we go. Manipulated bubble, bubble and all kinds of different formats and for and directions. Um, just these are pretty severe and obviously not something you would generally do to a photo. That's more if you're going to do some kind of graphics effects type of a thing that you want to have. So that's the basic overview. There is obviously a whole lot more to it, and that is what we will be exploring over the next several sessions. I don't know how many sessions this is going to be. Something tells me it's going to be a lot because this is big and deep, but this is what we're doing. This is the next live training session. So hopefully this app is of interest to you. Hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy following along on this. Um, for anybody who's watching this session and has never seen any session before, the way this works is this session, the overview session, is a free session. This will remain free forever and ever. Anybody can watch it. The remaining sessions, starting with 1601, we're at 16, right? Yes, 1601 and onward, will be free while they're live. So if you are able to watch it live, you can watch it for free. That also allows you to participate in the chat and ask questions live. If you are not able to do that or you just don't want to participate in the live one, you will be able to watch it later, either streaming from photoapps.expert website or purchasing it for download from photoapps.expert website. You can do those for a fee one by one, or you can be a monthly or annual member, in which will give you access to not only these videos, but every video in the live training session I've ever done. So that is obviously your best deal. Uh, members can stream it, non-members can download it um, for a fee, and if you're a member and you want to download it, you can do that as well for a very small additional fee, but the idea is ideally most people want to stream it. So paid, annual, or monthly members can stream all the content unlimited. So that's how the whole thing works. Photoapps.expert to learn more about that. Um, you'll see a little membership button. You can learn all about it there. And that's about it. That's where we're going to end it today. We are scratching the surface in today's session. There is a ton here. I'm excited to get into it with you guys. So with that said, it's time for me to go work on something else. I will see you guys next time. 
Uh, the next session, 1601, will be next week. Uh, watch, go to photoops.expert slash live, and you will see the date and time there. If you're watching this live, it's not there yet. It'll be up shortly. But if you're not watching this live, then that's where you'll see it. photoapps.expert slash live to find out when session 1601 will be. Take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.